let's go ahead and get started. Welcome to our July 2021 technical training meeting. On the screen is our agenda for today's meeting. We've got a couple of training opportunities, some new business, but uh, then our main topic is going to be, we're going to talk about attic preparation. Basically, we want to talk about what's required when it comes to attic preparation for the auditors, for the the weatherization technicians, and then also for the QCI. So that'll, that'll be our main topic. Before we jump into that, though, let me just go through some of the training opportunities and the new business we've got listed here. So the first thing is on the training opportunities at the IWTC, we've got a couple things on the calendar that I wanted to make you guys aware of. The first one, it, well, they're both the same. We, we basically have two BPI classes coming up. They're both for the energy auditor, we have one in August, and that class uh, right now is full. We've got some letters from some guys, and uh, we've got that class filled already. Um, but we have a large enough group of people that are getting ready to, uh, they're getting close to being BPI ready, that we have calendared a, another BPI energy auditor class in September. So if this is you, please pay attention. Um, September 27th through the 30th is when we have the class calendared for. And we're just going to do what we've done in the past where we're going to open up registration for the class right now. And basically the first four people that send in a letter and what that letter is, is that's after you've sent your application to BPI, BPI will send you a letter that says you can now sit for the class and for the test. And so the first four people to send me or Wade that letter that they get back from BPI, they get the seats. So um, yeah, they need to send it to you, Matt. Yeah, for right now, please send it to me. Wade's going to be out of commission for a little while. But, but either way, um, the goal is first four people to send in their letters, get the seat. So if you're getting close on that or if that follows your timeline, um, do everything you can to finish up whatever audits or whatever uh, paperwork you've got to do and get your applications into BPI as soon as you can. So if you guys have any questions on any of that, uh, feel free to reach out to me individually or, you know, if you have any questions and you want to just ask them here, then speak up. So any questions on that? All right. And with that, Brad, do you want to you want to give the program any specific guidance for uh, as far as what's going on with Wade right now? No, he's out on medical leave. Uh oh, I don't know if you guys heard that. Wade, Wade's gonna be taking uh, some extended leave right now. He's he got in an accident and he's not getting better very quickly. So, if you are trying to reach out to Wade and he's not responding, uh, pick another team member and we'll get back with you and, and help take care of whatever you're working with. So hopefully that's uh, enough info there. Um, under the new business, we got a few things here and a lot of them just pertain to the fact that it, we just passed July 1st. So wanted to just point out to everybody, as of July 1st, we started a new program year in our weatherization program. And there's a couple of things that they are always triggered by the new program year. Uh, but there's also, there's one really important thing that happened this year, which uh, is new or different. And that's that, um, that we now have a rolling 15 year reweatherization date. So it was passed into law a while ago that instead of having that um, that date, which was like September 30th of 1993 or four or somewhere back there that basically if you weatherize a home after that, you couldn't re-weatherize it. Well, uh, they have changed that. It's now a uh, rolling 15 year re-weatherization date, which means that basically if the home, uh, was weatherized more than 15 years ago, then it is now eligible to be re-weatherized and that became effective on July 1st. The rolling 15 year part of it would be based off of the start date on the job. So any questions on that? So beginning 
a couple of days ago, you can now you now use that 15 year rolling start date as your determination as to whether or not a home is eligible if it was already weatherized. All right. The other thing uh, is that the new guidelines were posted to our resources page. So um, there's been a few changes over the last year. We've we've already addressed all of them in these technical meetings and let you know what they are. Um, but any of those changes are now written and they are in the the effective uh, or the most current version of the guidelines, which if you look at that one, it has an effective date of July 1. So if you go to our resources page, you'll be able to see that. Uh, the other thing to be aware of, because it's a new program year, is that the fuel library costs, which were updated in you know a few months ago, those are also now effective as of July 1. So uh, someone from each of your agencies, we all got together last month and we had a meeting where we all put together a new uh, setup library for the year and we put in your new fuel library costs. Um, but the effective date on that fuel library cost was July 1. So as of a few days ago, you all should be using your new setup libraries with your new fuel library costs in it. So all of those things triggered just simply because we passed the 1st of July. Does anybody have any questions on any of that? Okay. The other thing I wanted to point out is just that uh, we have a new ASHRAE calculator. We've been using it for a few months now, but it is finally available also on our resources page. So let me go to the resources page. So the program guidelines, if you click on that, you'll see that it will bring up the most current version, which was effective July 1. And if it doesn't, you need to hit F5 on your keyboard, and that will refresh the screen. You've got a cached version of the old page on your computer that will update it because I've had a couple that they tell me, oh, it's not there. You've got to hit F5. Yeah, that I, I, I do that often. So basically your browser saves old copies of pages so that they'll load quicker. And if something has changed on that page, you have to hit F5 to refresh it or to throw that old copy away and get the new copy. Um, but yeah, so if that's not there and then same thing, uh, if you're looking for the new ASHRAE calculator, it's right where the old one was. It's just in the neat audit section. Just when you click on that, it will open a copy of the new one instead of the old one. So, all right. The other thing that I had for the new business was, um, I just want to remind everybody, we talked about this last month. We have issued a temporary adjustment to the HVAC repair versus replace guidance. And what that is, is that in our guidelines, we actually have some thresholds depending on when you're looking at HVAC equipment and you're trying to determine whether you should repair it or you should replace it. The thresholds are that once the repair costs pass like a $300 or $400 mark, depending on the age of the appliance and stuff, um, that you, you should then stop worrying about repairing it and you should consider replacing it. Well, we have suspended that because of the supply chain issues that we have with our HVAC equipment. So you're gonna kind of have to look at it on a case by case basis. If, if, you could, if you could replace it and replacement equipment is available, then continue to follow that guidance. But if replacement equipment is not available and the repairs are a little higher than what our cables allow, then you are allowed to go ahead and make those repairs. So if those repairs get excessive and you're feeling like you're not really sure about it, feel free to reach out to us and we might just have you submit a case by case request or something for that. But any Is questions? Any, has anybody got any feedback? Is that accessibility of HVAC parts get worse, better, same? <laughs> We can't seem to get condensers right now. Okay. Thanks, Scott. Anybody else? Even the uh, furnaces for us, they're they're on like a six month waiting list right now for back order. 
refrigerant and replacement parts, though. I mean, capacitors, etc., motors. Had any problems with those getting it or what? I know refrigerant supposedly has went through the roof. Um, not really yet. Hmm. Mainly thrust coils and condensers. Yeah. But you're able to get the replace or repair parts, Kyle? Yeah, parts are somewhat available. Somewhat. Okay. Yeah, again, just just keep us updated if there's significant changes, if we need to adapt or do other things to help you do what we can, you know. Yeah, hopefully this this uh, temporary suspension of this guidance gives you guys the freedom to do what you need to do there. I've noticed an uptick in repair on the BWR stuff that I've been looking at. So, uh, but yeah, if you guys need if you need anything from us, let us know based on your you know supply chain issues that you're dealing with. So. All right, the last thing that I had on new business was, um, and some of you may have already seen it, if you guys get the emails from the Energy Conservatory, uh, I just wanted to make sure everybody was aware. They have a, they've adjusted their calibration period on the DG1000, and then they've also got some a new tool on one of their apps. So let me just show you. I got some screenshots on those. So... The DG1000 has now been out in the field for more than four years, and they've been able to collect enough data that they have changed their calibration or recalibration requirements. And now you do not have to get the gauge recalibrated. Well, now you get it every four years instead of two. So... You don't have to get your gauges recalibrated except for every four years. And it says this change is retroactive, meaning all of the DG1000s it's effective on. So if you look at the back and it's telling you, you know, well, it says, for example, the gauge shown on the left was calibrated on December 30th of 20. Therefore, the next calibration is due on December 30th of 2024. So you now have four years on those gauges, which is great save us a little money and headache right probably so and turner i would add um for you agencies just make sure you stagger your calibration dates if you can on your equipment so you don't end up shipping everything out at the same time and ending up with all your gauges gone at the same time if you kind of stagger those it'll help keep production moving and so you're not being held up by equipment missing for calibration yeah excellent thank you and then the other thing, they, the Energy Conservatory has also added a new um, feature to the tech auto test, which is called Wind Assistant. And you might already have it on your phone. Uh, I did because my phone was set to automatically update the app. But if your phone's not set to automatically update it, you may have to manually go in and update the app or your phone or your tablet or whatever you're using the app on. But uh, when you're running the tech auto test app, make sure you have the most current version of it. And it will include this thing called wind assistant. And what that is, is if you are trying to run a blower door and you're getting uh, some fluctuations in the pressures between the inside the house and outside the house due to wind, then it will actually change the the time interval and it will it will take more readings and it'll it will uh, basically help uh, take the wind out of the equation. So kind of a cool feature. It'll give you more accurate uh, blower door readings, but it does take longer to run the test. So the wind assistant is set to be off and then whenever there are those fluctuations when you're trying to run your test it will actually ask you do you want to use the wind assistant you can turn it on for every one of your tests if you want but i, I it's my understanding it takes longer to run the test so you may want to just leave it the way they've set it and the app will tell you or ask you when you want to turn it on when it 
senses the wind. But anyway, has anybody run into that? Has anybody actually noticed that showing up on their test at all? Out in the field? Yeah, our guys have it showing up on theirs. Gotcha. Anybody speak to whether it takes a lot longer or just a little longer? Because I haven't actually experienced it yet. Well, that's that's what the uh, Energy Conservatory said, <clears throat> is that it might take a little longer when you're running the test with the wind assist on. So anyway, just want to make sure everybody's aware of that. Um, I think that was it for all of our, uh, you know, new business stuff. Does anybody have anything else they've been uh, wondering about or anything that should come before the group before we jump into the, the meat of our meeting today? All right. So with that, I'm going to talk for a little bit. Yeah, two things real fast. Oh, go ahead, man. As we're at the beginning of a new year, that means we're closing out the old year. Those people from your agency leadership that are on this, RFFs, your claims, you've got to have those claims in to me by noon on the 15th. Don't think you have to wait to the last minute. As soon as you have them ready, submit them. If is it a federal award, and you are expending all of the funds on that contract, the statement of expenditures must be attached or I send the claim back. Likewise, if you're submitting a claim, don't just walk away because I'm gonna review them pretty much as quick as they come in. And if I have to send it back, I need it corrected and fixed right away. You're in close out, it's always a big giant pain, but that's what has to happen. The second thing, Many of you may recall a conversation about an enhancement and innovation grant that was going to be ran by DOE as part of this additional um, takeoff from the allocation formula. July 1st, Department of Energy and the Federal Register issued a notice of intent. What this does is it creates a comment period for people that want to provide feedback to Department of Energy on the enhancement and innovation grant program they're going to be running. If any of you have any interest in this, I would uh, be more than glad to forge you the link if you ask me for it. So if you have any interest in that ENI grant later on when they finally issue the NOFA, Notice of Funding Opportunity, you probably ought to get in on the comment period. Cool. Thanks, Brad. All right. So with that, let's talk about attic prep. Um, I'm going to talk for a minute about attic prep as it pertains to energy auditors. And then Matt Dalton's going to talk about attic prep as it pertains to the installers and QCIs. So attic prep. Um, what that term is, is that, that is the terminology that you will find in the field guide, except for it's backward in the field guide. So in the field guide, it says it says insulation, and then it says prep attic. Um, and then if you hit the drop down menus, I think the drop down menus say attic prep. But either way, we're they're synonymous. We're talking about the same thing. Um, but what we want to talk about today is really just what you need to do before you install insulation in an attic. We saw. We saw a number of opportunities missed uh, during our monitoring this year and the year before as well. And so we want to talk about it. We want to uh, want to make everybody more aware of it, make sure that we're doing everything we need to be doing to prepare the attics before we add the insulation. And the information that we're going to be talking about is found in the field guide. So on my screen, I've got this is what you would see if you go to the field guide and actually pull up the insulation prep attic or the attic prep stuff. So it tells you what our desired outcome is, and then it shows you these five steps, which you we, we need to make sure we're addressing these five things uh, when it comes to attic prep. And, and these are the five things. So Dalton's going to um, get into the, the meat of each of them, but just so you know what we're talking about in general, we're talking about removing debris, installing insulation baffles, flagging uh, junction boxes, installing insulation rulers, 
and making sure that our high temp venting has appropriate insulation shielding around it. So uh, from an auditor standpoint, I want to ask this question. Uh, why and when, so I guess it's really two questions, why and when do we install insulation baffles? This is one we, we've seen a lot of opportunities missed uh, when it comes to insulation baffles. So let me ask the group, why? Why do we in the weatherization program install insulation baffles? in attics. That should be why should you install, not why you're installing them, because that's just it. You're finding them not installed. Gotcha. So why should we? What do you guys think out there? Discourage attic. wind washing. Discourage wind washing. Attic ventilation. Attic ventilation. Any other thoughts? So this is correct. We are doing it to prevent wind washing. Uh, the attic ventilation part of it, as that was my assumption too. Like I'm assuming that if we have good ventilation, it'll drop the temperature or it'll keep the temperatures, you know, lower in attics when it's hot and vice versa. Uh, but um, when we dug into the SWS, we found it really the main goal is to prevent wind washing to maximize the, the amount of insulation we have over the top plates, which, you know, if, if you have wind washing, it, it reduces that. And then also just to keep the uh, insulation uniform throughout the attic. So, and, and the SWS requires it because of the, the three bullet points above. Um, and it's not super important that you understand that the, the aspect of it not being focused on the good attic ventilation, um, but it, I thought it was very interesting, and and it really is important that you understand that it is to prevent wind washing, um, because that will help us to get this right. When Dalton starts talking about how we install the baffle, you need to keep in mind that the goal is to prevent the wind washing. If we if we have that right, the attic ventilation is going to work the way it's supposed to work. So anyway, so that's the why. What about the when? When are you guys required to install these baffles? What do you guys think? Whenever there's soffit venting. Whenever there's soffit venting. Okay, that, that is one of them. We're gonna go over a couple. There's actually three things that need to be in place. So whenever there's soffit venting, what else would trigger this? installing insulation yeah it it seems almost a little too obvious but it really that is the other one it's so whenever there's soffit ventilation and whenever we're adding insulation to the attic and then that the first one we have actually we discussed this at the state level and we realized that there's going to be some instances where you can't, the, the space is going to be too tight. You won't be able to add the baffles in. And so we would like to establish the standard that whenever there is a, the roof is a four pitch or greater, meaning, you know, that it's a four pitch, a five pitch, a six pitch, basically, you know, that, that there's at least the room of a four pitch or more in there. If it's less than that, we would consider that, we would consider it being no opportunity because the space would be too tight to install the baffles. And it's it really important to note that all three of these things must be present in order for you to re be required to install the baffles. So if, if you only have two of those, but one of them's missing, then there wouldn't be an opportunity to do this. Um, so how are you guys feeling about that? Any questions on, on these three things? And as I think that was Shad that mentioned that, you know, just we're going to install them when we are installing insulation in the attic. And that is that is key to all of this. The, the thing that's triggering all of the attic prep is that we are going to be installing more insulation in the attic. 
if you evaluated a house and you're not going to be installing any insulation in the attic, then the attic prep in general is not required. You wouldn't be prepping the attic if uh, you're not going to be going up there and adding a weatherization measure to it. So keep that in mind. Um, for those of you who may be newer to the program, th that term wind washing may be unfamiliar to you. Uh, hopefully these two pictures will help you understand it a little bit better. But what it is is that if you have a vented soffit, you've got usually have a vent down low at the soffit and then you you typically are going to have another vent up higher in the roof somewhere. So either some turtle vents or some ridge vents or something. And the idea is that um, that as wind blows on the house, as there is pressure changes due to temperature and, and other things in the attic, that it will actually naturally move air from the lower vents up through the attic up to the upper vents and ventilate the attic, hopefully dropping the temperature in the attic um, so that it's not so dang hot up there. But as it does that, if the white fluffy stuff is in the way, the wind actually starts to push that out of the way. Uh, I think this picture on the right seems to be a little more staged, uh, but the one on the left is, is more representative of what I have seen in attics, where if you have, you've got vented soffit below over time, it's actually, the air has moved through there and it's slowly moved that insulation away from where it was intended to be. And so now we have this space that doesn't have any insulation or has a lot less insulation. Uh, but that is what we call wind washing in the program. Um, and I, have you guys, anybody seen any extreme cases of this? Any interesting stories about any of that or anything like that that you guys want to share? I typically see the wind washing when I'm auditing a house. I see it on my infrared camera, usually before I've stuck my head up in the attic, and it gets pretty obvious um, when it is going on. So it's something you can you can start watch for that that heat signature on the ceiling, and you can poke your head up in the attic and see what's going on. Usually, something like that's gonna look like wind washing. So, so a couple things with that for auditors. As an auditor, if, if our standard is that you uh, were preventing wind washing and, um, and then we also have the standard of a four pitch or greater, then you need to be able to measure what the pitch of a roof is. And then you also need to be able to identify whether there is vented soffit or not. So, Let's talk about both of those things for just a minute. First off, the roof pitch. Um, some of you may already know this is maybe, you know, kind of basic stuff, but I just, if you are new or not familiar with this, I just want to talk about this for a minute. So the roof pitch is, is uh, it's documented as a four over a 12 or a 412 pitch or a 512 pitch. And what that is, is that you're going to have if it's a 412 pitch, you would have four inches of rise. So four inches of vertical rise for every 12 inches of vertical run. And so if you were measuring that from, you know, up on top of the roof, you could stick a level out there and you could just measure across your level and put a mark on your level and say, okay, here's, here's where it would be 12 inches. And then you just stick a tape measure down and you just say, okay, how far is it from here up to where where my level is level and where it's 12 inches away. And that would tell you what the pitch of that roof is. And so again, if, if it is a 412 or greater, then you would be, that, that's one of the three criteria that you need to measure to determine whether you should be putting baffles in that attic. You can measure it from inside the attic as well. So this is kind of that, that same measurement, but just flipped around. You don't necessarily need a level if if the attic has a uh, some horizontal um, ceiling joists. Uh, you can just measure from the ceiling joist, or you know, from like this little bird's mouth here. 
you could just measure out 12 inches and then measure you know vertically what that rise is you may need a level to make sure that you are measuring vertical uh, but again you're just looking at what is the rise in a 12 inch run so anybody have any questions on that or any tricks that they use when they're trying to measure the pitch of a roof. I felt like these were pretty representative of what I have done in the past when I've tried to, you know, when I need to figure out what a roof pitch is. But so auditors, this will be part of your responsibility would be to determine, is there an opportunity to install these baffles? And that would be measured by figuring out what the pitch of the roof is. So the other thing is you actually have to go look at the outside of the house and determine whether the soffit is vented or not. And so here's some examples of some unvented soffit. So we just have a solid substrate on the soffit here. Uh, and here we have probably aluminum or vinyl soffit, but you can see that there's none of those panels have the holes in them to allow for the venting. So this would be considered unvented. And here are some examples of some vented soffit. I think down here is what you would see most common, uh, just that aluminum or vinyl soffit with every, you know, every uh, few feet, you'll have a panel where there are holes in the soffit to allow for that venting. Uh, but You'll also see stuff like this where there'll be, you know, a solid substrate, but then there's, they've cut in the venting either in a, a long strip or they've cut in the venting, you know, every so often to allow for that soffit venting. So these, these would be considered vented soffit. Has anybody seen anything different from this or anything unique that surprised them? All right, so with that, there, there's one other thing I want to talk about here, but, um, but I'll get to it as we, write, we read through this. So what this is is a draft guideline change. We realize that uh, if we're going to establish the 412 pitch as part of our standard, that we probably need to put that into our guidelines. And we are going to put that into the auditor's section of the guidelines. It's not in the field guide because the field guide directs the work for the guys in the field. We're putting it into the auditor section because the auditor, it's, it's that person's job to determine whether or not there's an opportunity and then to direct that work. So we, we, uh, this is the proposed change. Um, I'm going to read through it here and, uh, I will send a copy of this out with today's meeting notes. And basically, uh, we'd like to just open up, the a two week comment period on this guideline change at the uh, end of the two weeks then it'll it will go into effect so if you have any questions or concerns just send them my way and i will compile them and if we need to make any adjustments or changes we will um, but this is the proposed guideline change and we would we propose to be putting it into the into section b9 which is that's the section where there's a lot of direction or guidance for auditors. And it would be B9.8.F, which is all about uh, evaluating addicts when you're doing an audit. So this says auditors shall determine when addict prep should be performed and should specify which addict prep steps shall be installed on the work order. Attic prep shall only be performed when insulation will be added as part of the weather of weatherization. Attic prep shall be included in the cost of insulating the attic. Auditors shall address all of the following attic prep steps when the opportunity exists. And so here's some of the steps we've talked about baffles and then this will get us into a couple of other things as well that we haven't talked about. But so for baffles, it says baffles shall be installed to prevent insulation wind washing and to maximize insulation depth at the attic perimeter. Baffles shall be installed in each truss bay 
that has an open airway to vented soffit. So what does that look like? Baffles shall be installed in each truss bay that has an open airway to vented soffit. Anybody tell me what that looks like or what they think that would look like based on what I wrote there? It'd be the shortened blocking between the trusses to allow for air, the uh, air movement. Yeah. So let me see if I can back up and we'll look at, I think that wind washing is a good example of this. So each bay, so this, this would be considered a bay between trusses, this space between the trusses. And we're talking about this space right where the trusses sit on the perimeter or the exterior walls. And you can see in this picture, there's some daylight coming through there. And on this bay here, it does not look like there's daylight coming through there. And that's, as Jesse just mentioned, they'll often, when they're framing it, they will, they will either shorten the blocks or they'll move the blocks forward so that there is an uh, a, uh, airway, uh, you know, over the top of the blocking, or sometimes they'll drill holes, or sometimes they'll just leave the blocking out so that there's an airway from the vented soffit up. So if that bay does not have solid blocking in there, then you would need to put a baffle in there. So like if this one was completely blocked off and there is no airway, then you would not need to put a baffle there because again, our whole goal is to prevent wind washing. So if there's a block there that is already preventing the air from coming through, you don't need to stick a baffle in there. But if all of the bays are open, they all have an airway, then you need to put a baffle in all of them. So we put that in the standard. Hopefully that's a good clear way. Baffles shall be installed in each truss bay that has an open airway to vented soffit. If you have a half inch gap, that's an open airway. Uh, baffles do not need to be installed when the soffit is not vented. Now, in this picture here, this whole section would be considered vented soffit. Just because there's a space between these vents, that does not mean that you don't have to put baffles in all of the truss bays here. If there's an airway that would basically open into, these, into this soffit, since this soffit is open and connected, then you would need to put baffles in that whole section there. So baffles do not need to be installed when the soffit is not vented. So basically, if you had that section where there was no venting at all, then you wouldn't need to put them in there. Uh, when the roof is less than a 412 pitch, the work area can be considered inaccessible and baffles do not need to be installed. Uh, you might notice that I put the can be, I put the weaker language there. Um, and what that means is that if you're an auditor and you get up in a space and you realize, yeah, it's a little less than a 412, but there's something unique in this area that actually allows us access to it, you know, the auditor can go ahead and call for the baffles to be installed if it's the right thing to do. Um, but that's only when we're, we're already considering the space inaccessible, but the auditor's identifying that maybe there is something going on that would allow access to this particular space. So. And then moving away from baffles, talking about a few other things that Dalton will get into. Uh, flags or markers shall be installed on all visible junction boxes per the field guide standard. This was another one that um, we wanted to clarify in our uh, auditor section that our standard for junction boxes is that when you get up in the attic during the audit, if the junction boxes are visible, that is what determines whether or not you're going to mark those or not. Now, we would love to see you if, if there's a little bit of insulation on top of them, but you can easily find them. Those really should be identified as well. 
But to give you a very clear standard, it's that if the junction boxes are visible, then you need to mark them. Uh, rulers shall be installed to meet the minimum number required by the field guide standard. And again, the field guide establishes these standards. There's a number of rulers per square feet in an attic. And uh, just the auditor know, needs to know that they actually need to figure out if there's the right amount of rulers. And if there are not, they need to add more to meet that minimum that is required by the field guide standard. Uh, all high temp attic penetrations shall have insulation damming installed per the field guide standard. And all debris shall be removed from the attic per the field guide standard. So I'll let Belton get into all of those in just a minute. But this is basically the, the proposed change that we'll make to the guidelines to, to help clarify and establish when we need to address these specific attic prep uh, steps. Any questions on this or anything sticking out to anybody that you're wondering about? Yep, I got a question about the baffles. Um, so yeah. you're saying you want a baffle in every bay area? Is that correct? Uh, Rather than to make up what the ventilation is? So the the standard we'd like to establish is that you would put a baffle in every bay that has an open airway to vented soffit. Okay. Does that, so what, what is your question or, or your concern there? I'm not. Like sure. by code, usually you're only putting in enough baffles to make up or to equal the amount of ventilation, you know, whether it's a ridge vent or a turtle vent. So a lot of new houses, it's only like one in every third bay they're doing one or depend on ventilation. So say you, you know, earlier you said put one in every single bay area between even between those two vents. So I was yeah. trying to clarify. Yeah, and I appreciate you bringing that up because I, I feel like that's something that is, it may, there may be some confusion around it. And that's, so uh, again, the if the whole goal is to prevent wind washing, Basically, uh, we need to go up and make sure that that opening, if, if there is an opening that, that, uh, or an airway down to the vented soffit, that we're sealing that off. Now, if you had like every third bay that it was missing a block and, and you've got that nice big opening for vented soffit, you really could put your baffles in each of those. And then if you had just that little half inch gap, but that also, you know, that is considered an airway. If the baffling was uh, not working or if it would be easier to just air seal that area, then you're welcome. You know, auditors could just call out to air seal those off that little gap and then put the baffles in every third or fourth bay as, you know, per the, uh, the way that they'd already constructed it. Um, so, does that help at all? Yeah, perfect. Thanks. But yeah, you've, you've got a good point that it really needs to, it, when you are doing it, um, we wouldn't want to diminish the amount of attic ventilation that's available, and it really should meet the minimum. Um, but also, I, I want to make sure that we're not, we are not telling you guys to go in and bring every attic up to ventilation code. We are telling you to go in and prep the attics to prevent wind washing. Does that make sense? Yep. I'll take the silence as a yes. Anyway, but yeah, think about it, discuss it in your groups and stuff. And if you have other questions and, you know, because the whole goal of the guidelines is to make it very, very clear what you are and are not supposed to do. So if anything else comes up, let me know. And if we, if we feel like it's something we want to make sure is in the guidelines, we can add it to the to the guidance there. So, um, so one of the things in the guidance that said that the the uh, auditors, the attic prep shall be included in the cost of insulating the attic. So this is what that looks like. It's an additional cost in some cases. Uh, in some cases, the cost of attic insulation includes rulers and a few things like that. But if there were other, th you know, other parts of it, like if there was a bunch of stuff that needed to be cleaned out of the attic or whatever, then uh, auditors, you should be including that in the additional cost, and you would 
anytime we do an additional cost, you're going to comment the additional cost, what that is for, for attic prep. In this case, if you had a bunch of things listed out for your attic prep, you might even say additional cost for attic prep. You could say see work order, or you could list out, you know, which aspects of the attic prep the additional cost was going to. But this is the bare minimum. You're going to put the cost there and you're going to explain that that cost is for your attic prep. Any questions on that? And then uh, on the work order. So here's a work order, a uh, pretty standard work order um, that basically just says we're going to add some insulation in the attic. It says add R19 of blown cellulose in each attic space. Looks like there's a couple of different attics. And then I like how the auditor has actually listed nine bags in attic one, 10 bags in attic two, and a couple of bags in attic three. Um, but what, you know, if, if this kind of stuff was happening in your attic, then the work order should be more specific. Here's an example of what should be included. So uh, work order would say install baffles in all open truss bays. And that here's a great picture that may better show what we're talking about there. Looks like this one was probably the intended ventilation. So you definitely want a baffle there. These ones where there's less light coming through, those are open airways. So they need to be addressed. If you're not going to address them with baffles, then you need to address them with some air sealing so that there are no longer open airways. But don't, if you're, if you're blocking off airways, you better make sure that you have the minimum required ventilation there because it was there before you started messing with it. So anyway, so install baffles in all open truss bays, mark all visible junction boxes, install three additional rulers evenly spaced in the attic. And I like this as an example where you know, in this photo here, there is a ruler, but obviously the auditor has figured out, oh, we're, you know, to meet the standard, we need three more and we need to space them out evenly in the attic. Uh, remove old ducting and roof debris, debris from the attic. Install insulation dam around furnace vent. And then it gets into add the blown cellulose and, and stuff, you know, about that. But... Anyway, so that's, this is really what auditors should be doing. They should be going up and determining which attic prep steps need to be done, and they should be noting them on the work order so that the guys can take the right materials to do the job they need to do. So that's the auditor stuff. Any, any questions before I'm going to turn the time over to Dalton, and he'll ta take you through the more of the field guide standard and stuff. All right, Dalton, do you want the screen or do you want uh, me just to forward slides? Um, you can click through it. That'll be right. fine. Um, if you want to click on the link to the field guide, I was just going to read the desired outcome. And Yeah. So Turner kind of already talked about this. Um, we do have a measure that's guiding the work on attic prep. Um, and under there, under the desired outcome, it says we want a continuous, contiguous, safe, and compliant thermal barrier insulation. So we want that. We're trying to maximize the amount of insulation that's going over those that perimeter of the attic where we've seen a couple of jobs where they did not install baffles. And that insulation, they've had to really taper it off so they didn't fill up the soffit with insulation. And so it really hindered how much the R value around the exterior of that. And then you want the baffles so that wind's not blowing through your insulation and really uh, cutting back the R value of it. So that's our desired outcome. And in the SWS, we're referencing um, the detail called accessible attic loose fill insulation and then accessible attic loose fill over existing insulation. So. Those are the two details that are kind of governing this measure. So if you need um, a little more insight, there's those links in the field guide that you can go and get a little more detail, but it's basically covered. We covered everything in our field guide. So um, if you want to go to slide 16, Turner. All right. So we'll go through each of these measures kind of in. Is this the right slide or back one? Yep. Nope. This is step one. This is good. Um, 
So the first step in our in the attic prep measure is remove debris. And it says remove all debris that won't allow the insulation to touch the attic floor or stay at the consistent depth. And we've got a picture, this was an attic a couple years ago um, when we were monitoring where there's a bunch of abandoned ductwork up in the attic. Stuff like that you need to remove before you add insulation. We don't want you just blowing insulation over this where there would be a bunch of voids. It'd be a huge diminished R value. Um, that stuff needs to be removed. You may, as installers, you may be cutting some of this up to get it out of the attic. Um, that's where Turner had talked about with the auditors. They need to include maybe some labor and stuff on jobs to get some debris removed. What would be acceptable to leave in an attic would be like the walkways where they can insulate underneath it and then over it. But you start getting other debris, um, we need to get that stuff removed. You guys have any questions on that step? It's pretty straight, straightforward. Have you guys seen much debris up in attics? What do you guys typically run into? Uh, empty boxes, storage boxes, Christmas decorations. <laughs> yeah, the old Christmas tree. So yeah, we're, the auditor should be trying to align that with the client to get any belongings like that removed. But then also, um, yeah, if you got empty boxes, that kind of stuff, don't just fill them up with insulation, get them removed, haul them out. So um, the second one was install baffles. And in our field guide, it says all vented soffits need to be baffled to the exterior side of the top plate with a one inch clearance from the roof deck extending at least six inches above the depth of the insulation to be installed. And if you'll go to the next slide, Turner, I think there, um, I've got, so let's see, we go to slide 17. I think you're on 18. There we go. Um, so we've got, we're talking about maintaining in that measure when it says maintain a one inch clearance. Some of your baffles, there's a few different kind of baffles. You've got some cardboard ones. These ones are styrofoam that's in this photo. Um, and they've got kind of these ribs going down the middle that help maintain that one inch clearance. They also have PVC baffles. So if you have like the cardboard ones don't really have anything that helps you maintain that one inch, but we don't really want, you don't want any greater gap than one inch, but you don't want any less because we want to maximize the amount of insulation we can put in there. So if you install that baffle like two inches or three inches down off the roof deck, you're just diminishing the amount of insulation you can install up there. So try to just maintain a one inch. And like I said, these ones kind of come with a, a one inch clearance on them. Um, you can go back to the one with the staple gun. Yeah. So you want to use the mechanical fastener. Um, the photo right there shows a staple gun. You can use a hammer tacker. You could use a pneumatic stapler if you wanted to drag a hose up there, but, um, you need to use some kind of uh, mechanical fastener to staple them either to the roof deck or to the truss. Um, I think the cardboard ones, a lot of them will staple down the side of the truss. And then um, like a styrofoam one, you, it just staples to the roof deck. But um, will you go to slide 20? The, so when we're talking about the baffle needs to run six inches above the finished level of the attic insulation, Turner drew this up for us and the, the pink parts showing the baffle and right there you can see at that that's a four foot baffle installed and it's about three and an eighth i think that says mm -hmm. above the insulation level so that would not be acceptable and they don't really make baffles any longer than four feet from what i what i found and so you may have to stack them one on top of the other to extend it up like you may have to put a two foot piece 
up above, um, depending on the depth of your insulation. But make sure you're going to end up at least six inches above the finished insulation level. So um, it may take it may take multiple baffles per bay. Um, Turner's kind of talked about which bays um, need a baffle in them. Um, the quick way too to find out, and he's already kind of hit it on this, was you can see from inside the attic, you can see the light coming up through them. Um, and if they're not, don't have a full blocking all the way up to the roof deck is your kind of your quick ways to identify. You may also need like a broom or a stick of some sort to kind of clear push back some insulation out of your way down in that bird's beak to be able to actually slide the baffle down in. Because a lot of the time you're going to be doing this work from about four feet out, four to six feet out from the actual top plate or the bird's beak. So you're going to be sliding the baffle down in there. And so you may need a stick or something to clear out the insulation so you can get the baffle all the way down over the top plate or blocking. Um, and then you're going to want to, if you can go to the next one, Turner, once you identified which bays and you've kind of cleared them out, stapling them up, um, a lot of times you're only going to probably be able to staple the top half of the baffle. Um, in this photo, you can see there on the right, I've got one high and then down a little bit farther because I tried to, when I, I installed this out in the dog house and I, I try to stay like at that six feet away point and just see how far down I could reach. But those styrofoam baffles are so light, just having a couple, one high and one part way down on the sides and in the middle, held that up nice and tight against the roof decking. Um, so be aware of that. You don't, more than likely, you're not going to be able to get clear down at the bottom to staple them up. You'll probably be doing the top half. On when you're fastening the baffles. Um, and so that that should allow, this is what we're kind of looking for. Um, that drawing there on the left, you can see where the air is coming up through the soft vent, um, up over the top of the baffle, and then it can go up to the higher ventilation up there. And it's not, it's not going through our insulation and impeding the integrity of the insulation or reducing our R value. Um, so our, our measure, which triggered this, is attic insulation, is protected and enhanced by, by these baffles being installed. It's not necessarily, like Turner said, it's not necessarily to meet the ASHRAE code. It's more driven by we're protecting the measure and enhancing the measure that we're installing, which is the insulation. Um, and then you, this is on the right there. That's just a photo of me looking down showing that there is like you can still see the daylight kind of down at the bottom of the, the baffle there. Um, so we got a good ventilation path. Um, and then on 24. So I've got a question on these. Will this prevent wind washing? What do you guys think on those two examples in those photos right there? No. Why not? Too short. Doesn't span the width of the bay. Yep. Yep. So typically you're going to have 24 on centers or six teams, and you want to, a lot of times in the attic, it's, it's 24. So you want to make sure you get a baffle that's the width of that bay. And um, you don't want, because there's going to be gaps on both those sides of that baffle that would still allow for wind washing. So just be aware of that. Make sure you got the appropriate material and that it's spanning the full full width of the bay. Um, the third step in our attic prep measure is flag the junction boxes. Um, and it says verify the following all electrical boxes have a cover knob and tube is not energized or is baffled around and flags are installed at all utility junctions that can be seen above the final level of the installation or insulation 
Um, and you could use a number of things to flag the junction boxes. The photo in our field guide has some stakes that they kind of spray painted the top half that they've tacked up. Um, this picture on the right, Mag was prepping an attic and they like to use the string and they just staple it high and low. That works really well. It's a really cheap, quick, easy way to mark those, effective way. Um, so do you guys have any questions on flagging junction boxes? Okay, you can go to the next. The next one. So number four was install rulers. Um, the standard is at a minimum of one per 300 square feet, depth rulers need to be installed with the bottom touching the attic floor. So the bottom of these rulers need to be touching the sheetrock or lath and plaster, whatever that attic floor substrate is. And out of these two photos here on the right, which photo is, or which ruler is incorrectly installed or could have issues once you start blowing in insulation? So the one, this one on the right, I've seen where if you just kind of tack those rulers low or in the middle, sometimes when you start blowing that insulation, it can pull them over and then they end up not being visible. The one on the left there is your, is what we'd like to see where you're kind of tacking it high and low. So it's not going to get folded over. You're better off um, doing that wherever possible. So, uh, and also, so I've just got a question on, on this. So if we had an attic that was 1,200 square feet, how many rulers should we see in that attic? At minimum. Four. Yep. What if we what if we had an attic that was two hundred square feet? What would you expect? That's all. The answer is one at minimum. Yeah. Yep. So we always want one at least at a minimum. Even if you just got this little two hundred square foot attic space, you you're at least going to put one in, no matter what. And then for every additional three hundred square feet, you need to add another ruler. And and again, that is the minimum. You could do it more often if your guys are newer at installing insulation and they're having trouble keeping it nice and level and even. You may, as the QCI or an agency, you may want them to install them more frequently just till they can get it down, keeping their insulation nice and level because it's easier when you're blowing insulation if you can kind of see those rulers to kind of keep it level. But, um, but that is the minimum requirement. Um, and then you can go to the next slide. So this fifth one, we're not going to go in deep detail on it because it's, it's its own measure. And, um, but on all the high temp penetrations, you need to be, you'll air seal and then baffle around them. And so you're going to be sealing off the chase is one part of that step. And then, or one part of that measure, and then actually creating a, a baffling around it. Um, do you guys have any questions on on that? Okay, I wanted to just talk really quick about the QCI. So Turner, if you'd go back to the, let me tell you what slide, to slide 16 real quick. So QCIs or anybody that wants to speak up, how would you verify this on the QCI? So you show up on a job, you're reading the work order and it says remove debris and you look at the audit photos and you can see all the garbage that the auditor took photos of or like this ductwork. 
how are you going to verify that they removed the debris? Okay. And the take pictures. Yep. That's going to, you don't really want to go tromp around out there and digging up all the new insulation just to verify that they didn't cover something up, right? Your, your most effective method for verifying step one would be through photos, production photos, in production photos. So the crew goes up, removes all the debris, they snap a photo, they get that to the QCI and you can verify, yes, okay, this is this attic and yep, all that debris was removed prior to them installing insula insulation, so. And then when you go to the next slide, um, how are you going to verify baffles to QCI? That they got or pictures from the crews. Yep, it's probably going to be a com could be a combination, right? Like if the if you're having the crews take photos, say they had one of those attics where they it had kind of a continuous um, soffit vent on the outside, but inside there was blocking and there was only uh, air space every four bays. You'd almost want a photo before they added insulation so you can see, yes, they air made sure those other bays were air sealed and they just baffled the ones that um, had an airway. So it could be that um, if they baffled every bay, verification after the insulation, they it should they should be extended up the six inches above the insulation so you should be able to actually verify the material after the fact because you can see them um do you guys have any questions on verifying baffles and then if 25 i think is the next one turner Okay, how would you, how's a QCI going to verify um, the junction boxes being flagged? Stick your head up there. Yeah, this one you should be able to kind of verify after the fact because they should be extending up above the, the existing insulation. You should see some kind of a marker, either a string or some other kind of a marker so um that one you could do after the fact and you might be able to from the auditor's photos kind of get an idea of how many junction boxes there were and that kind of thing um and then the last one or sorry the fourth one on the rulers again this is going to be just kind of an after getting up in the attic, seeing how many square feet your attic is, counting the rulers. Can you see them from the entrance? That's the other thing with the rulers. They need to be visible from where you're accessing the attic. Kind of they need to face that way. If they are, um, like in this photo with the, for the measure where they're up against those center posts, you'd want to have those facing the access. So what about on this one? What do you need to, as a QCI, to properly verify installing high temp shielding? Crew photos. Yeah, yep, because you're, otherwise you're gonna be going over there and digging down to verify they actually air sealed off that chase properly with metal and high temp caulk. And then, um, you should be able to, this, this baffling around the flue should be extending up above the insulation. So you, it's kind of a two part on that. It's good to have a cruise photo so you can see that it's extending all the way down to the attic floor. But then also you should be able to verify that that's above the insulation at the QCI inspection. So kind of a combination of photos and, and, uh, QCI inspection. So, um, do you guys have any questions on any of that? What we're, what we expect of you on attic prep? Okay, that's all. 
that's all I had, Turner. Cool. Well, uh, apologies that we went over. Hopefully this was some good information. Thank you to those of you who hung in with us to finish it out. Um, but yeah, if you have any questions, or concerns about the draft guidance or anything we've talked about today, let us know. Otherwise, hopefully this will be some good guidance for you guys and we can uh, raise the bar a little bit out there on our attic prep. Thank you guys. Have a great day. Thank you.